reading through the Bible in one year, October 9th, 1 Kings chapter 12, Philippians chapter 3, Ezekiel 42, and Psalm 94. Now, this is the split of the kingdom of Israel. Let me double check that. Yep, okay, kingdom divided. So, um, as we talked about yesterday, um, what happens is um, Solomon was given the entire kingdom. The entire kingdom had already wanted to split beforehand because they were following after um, Saul, right, who was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he uh, was chosen by God, and the people thought that they would be having another king just like all the other people in Israel. Well, not just in Israel, but I mean the people around the world, right? And the way that it worked is that the king of the kingdom would fall to the king's son. So the people of Benjamin thought, oh, well, now we are the people of the king. Therefore, our people will always be ruling over the people of Israel. But God chose somebody for himself. He chose David, who's through the line of Judah. So when uh, it was later told that, you know, God has taken away the kingdom from Saul and had given it to David and to the tribe of Judah, the people got angry. And so they had this, this anger against God uh, this whole time, waiting for something to happen so they could steal it back. And we saw that happening when, um, when Saul died. We saw them set up for themselves a king, and later on, um, that king died um, even though that happened afterward and after David had negotiated peace with them and had taken it over legally. Um, and we also had at the same time, well, not the same time, but much later, uh, when David was driven out by his son Absalom uh, after his sin with Bathsheba. Um, and, well, much later, but it still happened in the same time period, basically. Um, he had people cursing him and attacking him, saying, aha, aha, now you're losing the kingdom because of your evil in conspiracies against Saul. Again, they didn't understand, or they did understand, and they just didn't care. That's what was happening. So that is the pretext to what we're seeing here. What was the thing that God had promised? He had told David that if you and your descendants serve me faithfully, keeping all my laws, all my commandments, and all my statutes, then you will not lack a king to sit before me forever, and you will continue to reign over all Israel. Well, David did so, mostly, um, until the day of his death. Then his son Solomon reigned, and for most of his life, he actually kind of kept up with it. Not at the very beginning, and then he met with God and realized that he was doing things wrong. He repented, and then he served God faithfully until he had a thousand wives. And they all led him in all sorts of directions, and he followed all the gods of the land and um, did exactly the thing that the people were told not to do. Remember, this is the same Solomon who wrote the Songs of Solomon, right? Who wrote um, most, uh, not most, but a good chunk of the Proverbs and um, wrote some of the Psalms as well. This is a guy who was very well uh, acquainted with Scripture and knew the things that God had commanded but he still chose to follow other things. So God had promised saying that I will send after you some, well, sorry, I'm going to split the nation from you, right? I'm still going to allow you and your family to rule, which he does, um, but I'm still going to tear it free from you. And Solomon did the same thing that Saul did. When he found out the person who God had chosen to give the 10 tribes of Israel to, when the split comes in the next chapter, sorry, in this chapter here. What happened is that um, he tried to kill him, so he fled. Now, all of that is important because we're going to go through this information here now, and it's going to talk about how this Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, came back. And remember also that this Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had also been given the same instructions serve me properly. This is from God, right? Keep all my commandments, keep all my laws, keep all my statutes, and you and your family will reign before me forever. And I will keep you, and I will raise up your great nation for you, and I will keep you safe. Those are the promises he made to them. Let's see what happens. Then Rehoboam, 
the son of uh, Solomon, went to Shechem. For all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Now when Jeroboam the son of Nebat had heard of it, he was living in Egypt, for he was yet in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. We just talked about that. Then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard. Now, therefore, uh, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us, and we will serve you. Then he said to them, Depart for three days, and then return to me. So the people departed. Well, King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, well, How do you counsel me to answer this people? Well, then they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to this people today, and will serve them and grant them their petition, and speak good words to them, well, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the elders, uh, which they had given to him, and consulted with the young men who gave so who grew up with him. Yeah, there we go. Uh, who grew up with him. Uh, and served him. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father has put upon us? And the young men who grew up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to this people, who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, now you make it lighter for us. But you shall speak to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs, than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. I don't know how you would do that. Just do you throw them at the people? Do you make a whip out of scorpions? That would be terrifying. Then Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Return to me on the third day. The king answered the people harshly, for he forsook the advice of the elders that, that which they had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you, somehow, with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. For it was a turn of events brought about by the Lord, that he might establish his word, which he spoke through Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people said to the king, saying, what, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. They're basically saying, you know what? I'm done with you. You guys can rule this little area. That's fine. We're going to go. We're going to go home. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. The king Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death. He sent him out there to you know, make the people do what he said. And King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot to flee Jerusalem. So Israel had been or has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. This is one of the most understated statements in all of Scripture. This goes on for generations upon generations. It came about that when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. Again, just as God had said was going to happen. Now, when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who, who were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You must not go up, to fight against, go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house. For this thing has come about from me. 
So they listened to the word of the Lord and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. Let me see here. I'm going to drag this over a little bit so you can see this whole chart. This is a really good chart and it goes into a lot of great detail. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll through some of this for you. This goes over the years of the reign and, and the, the specific kings of Judah. And then I think it goes into the reign of the, um, uh, of the kings of, of Israel as well. In the meantime, I'm going to keep reading. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer their sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two calves, we might call them idols, and he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that you rather that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He was not a student of Scripture, or he would have known what had happened to the uh, to the people who did the same thing in um, in the wilderness. He set one in Bethel and he put the other in Dan. Now this thing became a sin. Again, duh. Uh, for the people went to worship before. Um, before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made... Uh, I lost my spot. There we go. And made priests from among all the people who are not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah, and went up to the altar. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. It's just the ultimate, and, and for a long time, you're going to find the same idolatry and the same um, wickedness that he does uh, here shown as, a, um, as an example of the kind of um, idolatry and wickedness that the kings of Israel do. And it will continue through the kings of Israel, just letting you know. We're going to continue reading here. So he, he instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, and instituted a feast for the sons of Israel, and went up to the altar to burn incense. All right, there we go. That's actually the list on the side here of all the kings, uh, both of um, Israel and of Judah. You'll notice that they cut off a little bit earlier in Israel. There's a reason for that, because God wipes them out. All right, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the rest of the notes here for you. All right, let's go on to Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the, of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision. Worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself have confidence in the flesh, if anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. 
Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of, or in, yeah, in view of the surpassing knowledge, uh, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, so that I might gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being confirmed, rather conformed, to his death, in order that I might attain the, the, to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also, rather for which also, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as, as, as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to, li to what lies ahead, I press onward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard uh, to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship, it's in heaven, from which we also eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the, uh, with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Bringing up the rest of the notes here. All right, there we go. Let's go to Ezekiel 42. Then he brought me out into the outer court, the way toward the north, and he brought me to the, to the chamber which was opposite the separate area and opposite the building toward the, uh, toward the north. Again, remember, Ezekiel is being walked around on a tour of this heavenly temple, right? And he's being led by an angel who's measuring everything, and he's describing it to people in the only way you really can without drawing them a picture of it. But even then, a picture would only show one side or one angle of it. He's giving them a complete, accurate description of the entire thing itself and allowing them to fill the rest in with their mind. Along the length, which was 100 cubits, was the north door, which was, and the width of that was 50 cubits. Opposite the 20 cubits, which belonged to the inner court, and opposite the pavement, which belonged to the outer court, was the gallery, or what, rather was gallery corresponding to gallery in three stories. Before the chambers was an inner walk, ten cubits wide, a way of one hundred cubits, and their uh, openings were, uh, were on the north. Now, the upper chambers, there you go, making sure I didn't miss any notes here, 
Now the upper chambers were smaller because the galleries took more space away from them than from the lower and middle ones in the building. For they were in three stories and had no pillars like the pillars of the courts. Therefore, the upper chambers were set back from the ground upward, more than, uh, the, more than the lower and middle ones. As for the outer wall by the side chambers, toward the outer, toward the outer court facing the chambers, its length was 50 cubits. For the length of the, of the chambers which were in the outer court was 50 cubits. And behold, the length of those facing the temple was a hundred cubits. Below these chambers was the entrance on the east side, as one enters them from the outer court. And the thickness of the wall of the court toward the east, toward the east, facing the separate area and facing the building, there were chambers. And the way in front of them, rather the way in front of them, was like the appearance of the chambers which were on the north. According to their length, so was their width. And all their exits were both according to their arrangements and openings. Corresponding to the openings of the chambers, which were toward the south, was an opening at the head of the way, the way in front of the wall toward the east, as one enters them. Then he said to me, The north chambers and the south chambers, which are opposite the separate area, they are the holy chambers where the priests who are near to the Lord shall eat the most holy things. There they shall lay the most holy things, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, for the place is holy. When the priests enter, they shall not go out into the outer court from the sanctuary without laying there their garments in which they minister, for they are holy. They shall put on other garments. Then they shall approach that which is uh, for the people. Now, when he had finished measuring the inner house, he brought me out by the way of the gate, which faced toward the east, and measured it all around. He measured on the east side, and uh, with the measuring reed, five hundred reeds by the measuring reed. He measured on the north side, five hundred reeds by the measuring reed. And on the south side, he measured five hundred reeds by the measuring reed. And he turned to the west side and measured five hundred reeds with the measuring reed. And uh, chapter, I think it was 41, we learned that this read is six cubits and a handbreadth. He measured it on the four sides. It had a wall all around, the length 500 and the width 500, to divide between the holy and the profane. And that is all the notes. All right, let's go ahead and go to Psalm 94. O Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render recompense to the proud. How long shall the wicked, O Lord? How long shall the wicked exalt? They pour forth words. They speak arrogantly. All who do wickedness vaunt themselves. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the orphans. They have said, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob pay heed. Pay heed, you senseless among the people. And when will you understand, you stupid ones? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who chastens the nations, Will he not rebuke, even he who teaches man knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they, are, that they are a mere breath. Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law, that you may grant him relief from the days of adversity until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not abandon his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. For judgment will be again, uh, rather, judgment will again be righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Who will take his stand for me against those who do wickedness? If the Lord had not been my help, 
my soul would soon have dwelt in the abode of silence. If I should say, my foot had slipped. Your loving kindness, O Lord, will hold me up. Would my anxious thoughts multiply within me? Your consolations delight my soul. Can a throne of destruction be allied with you? One which uh, devises mischief by decree? They band themselves together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has been my stronghold and my God the rock of my refuge. He has brought back their wickedness upon them and will destroy them in their evil. The Lord, our God, will destroy them. All right, that's all for today. Um, God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.